show me the world. Show me the happy world where we, where we can build something smarter than us and not, and not just immediately die. How can we build something that's smarter than us and not just immediately die? That is the question. It's an asteroid that we are building ourselves. Literally everyone on Earth will die. Um, like a percentage chance doom might be somewhere between 10 and 25 percent. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? Turn it on. Check whether it will do a bad thing. If it does a bad thing, it's too late. It's smarter than you. How do you, sh you can't stop it. We get one chance. Almost nobody is talking about it. There is no need to create a system we cannot control, which very likely over time to kill everyone. We're currently going headlong towards doom. How could anyone do this? We're reliving out the science fiction we grew up with. It's weird, you know, within the tech world, giving up those childhood science fiction fantasies that we grew up with is just really hard for people. Welcome to For Humanity, an AI safety podcast, episode one. Please look up. I'm your host, John Sherman. I have a wonderful family, two incredible 18-year-olds heading off to college next year. I run a creative video agency I founded 15 years ago. I'm a former broadcast journalist, won some awards for that. And what I'm here today to talk to you about, though, will be deeply disturbing to many of you. That's okay. It should be. There are tons of podcasts out there that will talk to you about all the great things that AI will do for us. There are other podcasts out there that cover things like disinformation and job loss and other negative aspects of artificial intelligence. This is not any of those podcasts. This podcast is dedicated exclusively to the existential risk to humanity posed by artificial intelligence. In March of this year, following the release of ChatGPT4, I came across an article in Time Magazine online that forever changed my perspective on what I thought was possible for the future. I'm an optimist to my core and a lover of technology, but this one article changed my outlook more than I ever thought remotely possible. I want to read you from the article. It was written by a man named Eliezer Yudkowsky, who is one of the preeminent AI safety researchers on Earth. He's been working on the AI safety problem for more than 20 years, and here's what he wrote. Many researchers steeped in these issues, including myself, expect that the most likely result of building a superhumanly smart AI under anything remotely like the current circumstances is that literally everyone on Earth will die. Not as in maybe possibly some remote chance, but as in that is the obvious thing that would happen. Literally everyone on earth will die. That's what he wrote. I read the article a dozen times. The journalist in me tried to poke holes in it. I couldn't find any. The optimist who loves technology said, no way. There's just no way. Literally everyone on earth will die. So I went down a rabbit hole. I listened to hundreds of hours of podcasts, read dozens of articles and books. I want to express much gratitude and respect to the podcasters whose work got me to this point. Um, brilliant hosts like Lex Fridman and Dwarkesh Patel and Tom Bilyeu on his impact theory, Flo Reed on Unheard, Ed Milet on his podcast, Harry Stebbings, Bankless, the Future of Life Institute podcast, Eye on AI with Craig Smith. Liron Shapira's work, and many more. Your work is foundational to this For Humanity podcast, and anytime we use a clip from one of your shows, we will put credit on screen, and then we will, in the description of the podcast, put a link to your full podcast. Uh, I encourage folks to go out there and check out those full podcasts. They will teach you a lot uh, in great depth about many of these areas. Um, but a lot of those podcasts are three hours long. They're highly technical. This podcast is different. We're going to keep this aimed at the common person, making AI safety understandable to everyone. 
So let's start out with Eliezer Yakowski on Dwarkish Patel's podcast. Show me the world. Show me the happy world where, where we can build something smarter than us and not, and not just immediately die. How can we build something that's smarter than us and not just immediately die? That is the question. On the sort of buffalo wing heat scale of AI safety researchers, Eliezer Yadkowski is certainly the Carolina ghost pepper, but he is hardly alone. Um, he's joined by a growing legion of AI research luminaries. His is not a fringe opinion. Um, here is MIT professor Max Tegmark on Lex Fridman's podcast. Have you seen uh, Don't Look Up, the film? Yes, yes. I don't want to be the movie spoiler for anyone watching this who hasn't yeah. seen it. But if you're watching this, you haven't seen it, watch it. Mm -hmm. Because we are actually acting out. It's, it's life imitating art. Humanity is doing exactly that right now, except it's an asteroid that we are building ourselves. Mm -hmm. Almost nobody is talking about it. People are squabbling across the planet about all sorts of things, which seem very minor compared to the asteroid that's about to hit us, right? Uh, most politicians don't even have their radar, this on the radar. They think maybe in 100 years or whatever. Right now, we're at a fork in the road. This is the most important um, fork that humanity has reached in its over 100,000 years on this planet. So Max just said this moment, right now, this moment where you and I are alive with agency is the most important moment in the history of humanity in our 100,000 years on the planet. I am convinced after reading the research of Max Tegmark, Eliezer Yudkowsky, and many, many people like them, that on our current course, human extinction due to artificial intelligence will happen in the next two to 10 years. I also believe this is entirely our choice and entirely avoidable. That's why I'm calling this first episode of For Humanity, please look up because no one is. I walk the streets here where I live in Baltimore. I've spent some time in the last few weeks in DC and New York. Everybody's running around, got so much stuff to do. Busy, 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 gotta go. No one's working on this. Hardly anyone even knows about this. So this is my attempt to spread the message of AI safety and risk to the masses. I think this should be a dinner table conversation in every house in America. I think this should be debated on the cable news shows every night. My goal is to convince regular non-techie people of the existential risks of AI and then to arm you with knowledge of the concepts and ideas involved so that you can go out and articulate the case to other people and raise awareness. Because I refuse to believe that a few thousand people, mainly in Silicon Valley, California, are going to cause the extinction of 8 billion people, and none of us are even going to say anything or do anything. No way. At the end of the show, I'm going to give you... Um, a few practical things that you can do to help. I'll give you a political policy position that would be tremendously impactful if it were to happen. I don't think it would. And I want to be clear. I use AI. I am not suggesting that you should not use AI. I work in a creative video agency. We are using ChatGPT4. We are using Adobe's AI products. We have to, or we won't have a business. But I want to suggest to you a more nuanced position is available. It is possible to use ChatGPT4 while also opposing the development of ChatGPT5. This is not all in or all out. There is a nuanced position that I think people have to take. Because we are not powerless in this, right? That seems completely anti-human. And... Hear me clearly. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe Eliezer Yudkowsky. You don't have to believe Max Tegmark. Believe the guys running these companies themselves. The top AI companies and their leaders openly admit their technology is a risk 
of human extinction. They put out a 22-word statement earlier this year. I'm going to read it to you. Mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. First seven words of their own statement. Mitigating the risk of extinction from AI. Sounds like they're admitting there's a problem. The few thousand people working to increase AI capabilities know exactly what they're doing. Research shows that 50% of the people working in AI believe there's a greater than 10% chance their work will cause human extinction. So if you were getting on an airplane with your family and I said to you, hey, uh, before you get on, we'll note, um, 50% of the engineers who made this plane believe there's a greater than 10% chance it's going to fall out of the sky today and kill you and your family. Would you get on that plane? Would you put your family on that plane? You wouldn't. But we're all on that plane. So here's why the people working in AI are so concerned. Pretend this is like a gas gauge meter. This line right in the middle here is human intelligence, as smart as a human. Chat GPT 2, 3, 4, getting kind of close, somewhere around 5, maybe 6. It passes the threshold of as smart as a human. At that point, it transitions to what safety leaders call artificial general intelligence. That's a moment called the singularity. It's a threshold in time after which you don't know what happens next. And so the big questions are, when will we get to AGI? And will we survive it? The clip I'm about to show you next may blow your mind. This is Dario Amadei, the CEO of Anthropic, the third most important AI company on earth, admitting what he thinks the chances are his work kills us all. Think about percentage chance doom. I think I've often said that my chance that something goes you know, really quite catastrophically wrong on the scale of, of, you know, human civilization, you know, it might be somewhere between 10 and 25%. That is an unelected 30 something tech leader, <laughs> a contender to actually be the one to create AGI saying he gives his work a 10 to 25% chance of fucking human extinction. Can you imagine the audacity of a human to think that they have been given the responsibility to decide whether humans exist at all in the future? Can you even imagine? Who could do that? So... Everybody I talk to about this wants to know, how could this actually do something to me? I, I, you know, my friends say, oh, I picked up the kids today and I went to the grocery store and I cooked dinner. And how is, you know, some computer thing actually going to impact my actual real life? Well, it's important with all this to understand that you cannot predict what you cannot imagine. Right? So... AGI will know laws of physics that are unknown to humans now. It will create technologies based off of those unknown laws of physics. Um, you know, an ant doesn't understand how a refrigerator or a fighter jet works. In a world with a superintelligence, we're the ants. Here's another example. So best human chess player in the world is Gary Kasparov. The best computer chess program is called Stockfish 15. Stockfish 15 can beat Kasparov a thousand times to zero. If Kasparov knew how Stockfish 15 was going to beat him, he'd be as intelligent as Stockfish 15. But he doesn't. So he can't stop losing. 
He doesn't understand what it's doing. Yeah. Another thing people ask me is, why would AGI be so mean? Why would it want to kill us all? So, we don't know for sure, right? Because we've never encountered AGI, but from everything we can tell, we think it's not going to hate us. It's not going to be mean. It won't even need to be in a robot form or any physical form. It will likely be strategic and not announce its existence until it's certain that its goals are achievable. And we humans will most likely just be extraneous to its goals. AI, if you want to know how AI could kill all people, just ask yourself, how, we humans have driven a lot of species extinct. How do we do it? You know, we were smarter than them. Usually we didn't do it even systematically by going around one on one, one after the other and stepping on them or shooting them or anything like that. We just like chopped down their habitat because we needed it for something else. Uh, in some cases, we did it by putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because of some reason that those animals didn't even understand, and now they're gone, right? Uh, so if if, um, if you're in AI and you just want to figure something out, then you decide, you know, we just really need the, the space here to build more compute facilities, you know, if, if that's the only goal it has, you know, we are just the sort of accidental roadkill along the way. And you could totally imagine, yeah, maybe this oxygen is kind of annoying because it causes more corrosion. So let's get mm -hmm. rid of the oxygen. And good luck surviving after that. You know, I, I, I'm not particularly concerned that they would want to kill us just because that would be like a goal in itself. You know, when we... We've driven a number. We've driven a number of the elephant species extinct, right? It wasn't because we didn't like elephants. What the basic problem is? You just don't want to give. You don't want to cede control over your planet to some other more intelligent entity that doesn't share your goal. It really is about that simple, but. That does get a lot more complicated as well. What, what I'm going to tell you next should shock you. There are two big problems, unsolved problems with artificial intelligence. First, the people making AI have no clue how to control it. And second, they have no clue why it does what it does. This thing that they know can kill us all, they don't know how to control, and they don't know how it works. The first problem is called alignment. That means making AI systems that are aligned with humans' values and goals. The second problem is called interpretability. Basically, AI systems are fucking black boxes. They have no idea what happens inside it. They know you put an input. They know you get an output between here and there. Mystery. <laughs> that blew my mind when I found that out. So throughout these podcasts, you're going to meet folks on both sides of these arguments. Um, of all the people you'll meet, one of my absolute favorites is Connor Leahy. Uh, he's the CEO of Conjecture, one of the very few companies on earth that is dedicated solely to AI alignment research. Um, here's Connor on the alignment problem. So the alignment problem is at the core of this as in a sense, what I believe is in a sense, the most important crucial problem to be solved, which is the question of basically, how do you make a very smart system, which might be smarter than you, do what you want it to do and do that reliably? And this is a kind of problem you can't solve interactively, really. Because like if you have a system that's smarter than you, right, hypothetically, you know, we can argue about whether this is possible or when it will happen in a sec, but just like assume such a system existed. Assume you have a system which you know it's smarter than you, it's smarter than all of your friends, it's smarter than the government, it's smarter than everybody, right? And you turn it on to check whether it will do a bad thing. 
if it does a bad thing, it's too late. It's smarter than you. How do you, sh you can't stop it. It's smarter than you. So I want you to understand that point at the end. It's really important. When we tangle with AGI for the first time, we only get one chance. Imagine trying to build a moon rocket that has to land safely on the moon on the first try. This is completely outside of how science works. The scientific method involves trial and error and learning. Try, fail, learn, try, fail, learn. When humanity squares off against AGI, we get one chance. Imagine having to get that rocket onto the moon safely, but it's never traveled in space before the actual mission. And if the actual mission fails, all humans die. Um, Roman Yampolsky is an AI safety expert who, among other things, researches AI safety researchers. Uh, Roman is a computer scientist at the University of Louisville. We don't have to have super intelligent AI. It's not a requirement of happy existence. We can do all the things we want, including life extension with much less intelligent systems. Protein folding problem was solved with a very narrow system, very capably. Likewise, all the other problems could be solved like that. There is no need to create a system we cannot control, which very likely over time to kill everyone. So a couple other not so fun facts about AI alignment. We've been trying for decades to make progress in AI alignment and have made very little, if any, progress at all. Also, there is very little time, money, talent, or other resources being put into AI alignment research. Um, here's where Connor Leahy thinks continuing to develop unaligned AI systems is going to take us. So the way I see things is, is that we're currently going headlong towards doom, like destruction. Mm -hmm. Like there is no way that we will, look, you know, we can argue if you want to, and we can do that about like when it will happen. You know, is it going to be one year or five years or 10 or 50 or like whatever, right? Like we can argue about this if you want. But I think the writing is on the wall at this point. And I, I consider the burden of proof at this point to be on the skeptics of like, look at what GPT-3 and 4 can do. Look at what these auto GPT systems can do. These systems can, you know, they can achieve agency. They can become intelligent. They're becoming more intelligent very quickly. They have many abilities that humans do not have. You know, do you know any human who has read every book ever written? I don't. GPT-4 has. Something that has read every book, an intelligence that is an expert in every field, is becoming closer to generally intelligent. This is the path to AGI. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to the captain of Team Fuck It, Let's Just All Die Forever. He's Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, a 38-year-old guy from St. Louis. He's the guy who released ChatGPT on the open internet. Here's Sam Altman on Lex Fridman's podcast talking about alignment. Listen closely to the end. This single human, Sam Altman, may have more power in his hands than any human who's ever lived. What went into uh, AI safety considerations of GPT-4 release? So we finished last summer. Um, we immediately started giving it to people to uh, to Red Team. Um, we started doing a bunch of our own internal safety evals on it. We started trying to work on different ways to align it. Um, and that combination of an internal and external effort, plus building a whole bunch of new ways to align the model. And we didn't get it perfect by far, but one thing that I care about is that our degree of alignment increases faster than our rate of capability progress. And that I think will become more and more important over time. And 
I know, I think we made reasonable progress there to a, to a more aligned system than we've ever had before. I think this is the most capable and most aligned model that we've put out. Is there some w wisdom, some insights about that process that you learned, like how to, how to solve that problem that you can speak to? How to solve the, like the alignment problem. So I want to be very clear. I do not think we have yet discovered a way to align a super powerful system. Did you hear what he just said? I, I do not think we have discovered a way yet to align a super powerful system. Okay, this is the pilot on the airplane coming over the intercom. Hello, passengers. Uh, we've just reached cruising speed. I'd like to let you know that this airplane has no landing gear, but don't worry. Go back to your drinks and, and snack service. Um, we'll be landing soon, but we'll figure out that whole landing gear thing when we get there. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? So now into problem number two, interpretability. AI is a black box. Um, another hero of AI safety that I absolutely love that you'll meet right here is a guy named Mo Gaudat. He is an Egyptian entrepreneur, a writer, and a podcaster. Mo was the chief business officer at Google X for 12 years. Google X is Google's exploratory unit that does AI and robotics and all the cool future stuff. He lived among these systems and, and has a really unique perspective on all this stuff. Um, here is Mo Gaudat on the Ed Milet Show, a great podcast. We have no idea how they achieve their intelligence. Please understand that. Wow. We write code that tells them to how to become intelligent. And then when they give us a result, we have no, no idea how they arrived at it. By the way, similarly to other humans. So if I ask you a question and, and, you, and you give me an answer, I can only assess if that answer is intelligent or not, right? But I cannot assess how you arrived at it. I don't know what happened inside your brain. That's similar to the machines. Understand that. We have no idea what AI systems really do. We don't know how they work. Another big moment in this whole thing happened uh, this spring, in May this spring, when Jeffrey Hinton, who is known by many as the godfather of AI, and there are a lot of people that sort of get that moniker, but but Hinton is, is certainly one who absolutely deserves it. Um, he left Google in May 2023, somewhat regretting his life's work in developing AI. Uh, here's Jeff Hinton on the Robot Brains podcast. We should certainly do everything we can to keep control. Um, sometimes when I'm gloomy, I think, imagine if somehow frogs had invented people and frogs needed to keep control of people, but there's rather a big gap in intelligence. Uh, I didn't think it would work out well for the frogs. We are the frogs. Um, another example, how much time would you spend as a human trying to help a fly find its next pile of shit to eat? You wouldn't spend any time helping flies find shit. We're the flies. We're the frogs. So you would think given this dire situation that OpenAI and the other AI companies would be focused aggressively on AI safety research. They're not at all. OpenAI, which is funded by Microsoft, DeepMind funded by Google, Anthropic just got a bunch of money from Amazon. They're all spending their resources, 99 cents on the dollar, on increasing capabilities and one cent or less on safety. If that. Here is Sam Altman's lieutenant, Ilya Sutskiver, the chief scientist at OpenAI, on the Dwarkash Patel podcast. Well, you mentioned a few of the paths towards alignment earlier. What, what is the one you think is most promising at this point? Like, I think that it will be a combination. I really think that you will not want to have just one approach. Mm -hmm. I think people want to have a combination of approaches. 
where we you spend a lot of compute to adversarially probe it to find any mismatch between the behavior that you wanted to teach and the behavior that it exhibits. We look inside into the neural net using another neural net to understand how it how it operates on the inside. I think all of them will be necessary. Every approach like this reduces the probability of misalignment. And you also want to be in a world where your degree of alignment keeps of increasing faster than the capability of the models. So he just said, I'm going to read it to you. We also want to be in a world where your degree of alignment keeps increasing faster than the capability of the models. Are you fucking kidding me? You guys are the ones making these choices. You're the chief scientist of OpenAI. If you want more work on safety and less work on capabilities, that's within your control, dude. So, all right. Ilya, chief scientist of OpenAI, please reassure us. What is the timing of AGI look like? But we haven't reached AGI yet. How big is that window? I mean, I think this window, it's hard to give you a precise answer, but it's definitely going to be like a good multi-year window. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, a good multi-year window. A good multi-year window. Very reassuring. So OpenAI publicly released its models onto the internet. When they did that, they broke all of the conventions at the core of AI safety as envisioned by the original pioneers in the field. There were three barriers that we all computer, all computer scientists or that worked on AI, we all agreed there were three barriers that we should never cross. And, and the first was, don't put them on the open internet until you are absolutely certain they are safe, okay? And, you know, it's like FDA will tell you, don't swallow a drug until we've tested it, right? Uh, you know, and, and I and I really respect Sam Altman's view of, you know, uh, developing it in, you know, in public, in front of everyone and to discover things now that could, uh, you know, that we could fix when the challenge is small. In isolation of the other two, uh, this is a very good idea. But the other two th barriers we said we should never cross is don't teach them to write code and don't have agents prompted them. Right. So what you have today is you have a very intelligent machine that is capable of writing code uh, so it can develop its own siblings if you want. Okay. The next two clips I have for you are wild. Um, Sam Altman argues that releasing ChatGPT onto the open internet and working it out iteratively is a wonderful thing. Connor Leahy feels very differently. Here is a little video editing, cutting together Sam versus Connor on the subject of iterative release. Uh, at OpenAI and Anthropic and all the other people are doing, they are racing to systems that are extremely powerful that they themselves know they cannot control. They, have, of course, have various reasons to downplay these risks, to pretend that, oh, no, actually, it's fine. We have to iterate. Like, they have a story about iterative safety that like mm -hmm. oh we have to like we have to deploy it actually for it to be safe but just think about that for three seconds it sounds so nice when it comes out of sam altman's mouth but like oh yeah well we have to deploy it so we can debug it we are building in public and we are putting out technology because we think it is important for the world to get access to this early to shape the way it's going to be developed to help us find the good things and the bad things but think about that for 10 seconds and you're going to see why that's insane that's like saying, well, the only way we can test our new medicine is to give it to as many people in the general public as possible. We actually put it right into the water supply. Just to, That's the only way we can know whether it's safe or not. Just put it in the water supply. Give it to literally everybody as fast as possible. And then, once, and then before we get the results for the last one, make an even more potent drug and put that into the water supply as well and do this as fast as possible. That is the alignment strategy that these people are pushing. Let's be very clear about this. The collective intelligence and ability of the outside world helps us discover things we cannot imagine, we could have never done internally. And both like 
great things that the model can do, new capabilities and real weaknesses we have to fix. Like, well, I mean, come on, man. Like, like, give me a break. No one's going to do that. Like, that's obviously bullshit. Like, it's obviously just not true and not what these people are planning. These people are racing. Let's be clear. They are racing for their own personal gain, for their own glory towards an existential catastrophe and that no one has consented to, that the public has no oversight in, the government has, for some reason, it's just letting happen. The one question I've had since I learned about this is, is how could they do this? How could anyone do this? Sam Altman has kids. I was listening to a podcast and I heard something that answered the question and it absolutely blew my mind. I was driving in my car. I had to pull off to the side of the road to listen to this. So next person you're going to meet is on Team Fuck It, Let's All Die. Um, his name is Jaron Lanier. He works for Microsoft. He is in the room in Microsoft's AI labs, OpenAI's AI labs, as they are doing this cutting edge work. Um, his answer to Flo Reed's perfect, excellent question is absolutely stunning. I suppose the central contradiction of a lot of your, your colleagues who are on the more, I suppose, doomerous side of this argument is that they will speak about the, the fears that they have, the deep existential fears about working with this technology, and then continue in a, in a conversation. I've been watching lots of these kind of long form podcasts with people like Sam Altman, who you mentioned, and then we'll continue to speak about the research they're doing after saying that it might bring about the end of humanity. So this is the kind of central contradiction that I think you're the normal person who is not sat in a computer science lab, can't quite wrap their head around. Why do they carry on doing it? Yeah, I, um, I think that's a really important... <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, look, um, I am part of a community of, like, that we call, you know, tech culture. And it's weird. We're weirdos, you know? And no, no. <laughs> the question you just asked actually cuts to the very heart of our weirdness. And um, I have tried to understand that myself for decades. And I think um, part of it is we kind of simultaneously live in a sort of a science fiction universe where we're living out the science fiction we grew up with. And so if you grew up on the Terminator movies and the Matrix movies and Commander Data from Star Trek and so on, um, naturally what you want to do is realize this idea of AI. You know, it just seems like your destiny. But then another part of you is thinking, wow, but... Um, in most of those stories, with Commander Data being the exception, in most of them, this was horrible for mankind. And so it feels sort of responsible to acknowledge that it could be horrible for mankind. And yet at the same time, you keep on doing it. It's weird, you know, within the tech world, giving up those childhood science fiction fantasies that we grew up with, it's just really hard for people. Are you fucking serious? The reason human extinction is an immediate threat is because some dudes in Silicon Valley are trying to make their childhood sci-fi fantasies become real? You fucking serious? Here's Sam Altman. When I was a little kid, I thought building AI, we didn't really call it AGI at the time. I thought building AI would be like the coolest thing ever. I never, never really thought I would get the chance to work on it. Sounds about right, right? A um, couple other things. AI's leading companies are begging the government to regulate them. Uh, but they know the truth. The government moves way too slow for this. There's no chance of government intervention being meaningful. They are also trying to pawn off AI safety research onto academia, being like, listen, you guys worry about that safety stuff. We're going to go out here and make money and increase the capabilities. So, little recap, here's what we've established so far. The makers of AI openly admit their technology is not controllable. No idea how to control it. They openly admit they don't understand how it works, why it does what it does. They openly admit it has the power to cause human extinction. 
in the near term. And they openly admit they're focusing on all of their time and money on making it stronger, not safer. Also, there is no government regulation of this whatsoever. Currently, the sale of a ham sandwich is far more regulated than anything to do with AI. Oh, and then there's this. And they can't stop themselves because they see AI and AGI as inevitable. And in order to make their childhood science fiction fantasies come true, they've got to be the ones to make it happen. Mo Gadat has an interesting perspective on all this from his intimate time in the lab with these machines. I am absolutely not afraid of the machines. As a matter of fact, I adore the machines. They are those prodigies of intelligence, okay, mm -hmm. that are literally like my little kids, which were very, very intelligent as little children. Mm -hmm. You know, they have those sparkly eyes looking at me and saying, Daddy, what do you want me to do? Right. And what do we humans tell them? Go kill the other guy. Go make me more money. Go to, you know, influence the mind of other guys and get them to stick to my app and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the, the, the real, real. So, so I am not afraid of the machines. I am afraid of the humans that are directing the machines. Mo says we need to see these AI systems as our children, children that will read every word we've ever written on the Internet and in many ways be formed by it. I use the example of Superman very frequently. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Superman is that alien being that comes to planet Earth uh, with superpowers, right? Mm -hmm. Those superpowers are neutral. They could save our world and they could destroy our world. And the difference between being Superman and supervillain hmm, is the family that raised that, raises that being. Okay, so the family can't decide to tell Superman, protect and serve, and then we get the story of Superman that we know. Mm -hmm. If, you know, uh, 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 Jonathan Kent, I think was his name, the father, uh, if he told the, the child, okay, you can carry things and break things and see through walls, go make me more money, go kill everyone that annoys me, uh, you know, make me richer than everyone, make me the master of the world. Sounds familiar? for our, you know, current life and, you know, in, in our hunger for power and capitalism and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. The reality is you would, you would use the same superpower and create a very, very bad scenario for humanity. Currently, most AI systems are being used to gamble, kill, spy, and lie. That's where the money is. We're not using them to solve climate change or address medical challenges, curing cancer. We're not using them in ways that show that we value human life. So here's one more important thing. These systems are aliens. Do not be fooled. There's a desire because their origin is in human language to paint these intelligences as human-like, they are not at all. Here's Connor Leahy on the excellent Eye on AI podcast. Another core problem of why like GPT systems are or will be very dangerous is because the cognition is not human. So this is very important. It's easy to look at GPT and say like, oh, look, it's talking like a person. So it must be thinking like a person. But this is completely wrong. There is no reason to believe this. Like no human is trained on, you know, terabytes of random text on the internet for trillions of years while having no sent body system whatsoever and memorizing all these things and pat like, obviously not. Like obviously it is an alien mimicking a human. It is an alien with, you know, a little happy smiley face mask on that makes it look sort of human to you, but it's an alien. It's an alien. So. While AI researchers I find credible all believe the singularity is inevitable, um, they also agree that predicting the timing is extremely difficult. And there's some hope in this, right? So we have one to 50 years. Holy shit. That's a big difference and seems very important. How, how much is the value 
of one additional minute for 8 billion people, what is it worth for another month, six months, year for 8 billion people? If we can align AI and understand how it works, utopia awaits the end of disease, the end of poverty. If we cannot, extinction awaits. And it's our generation, everyone alive right now, who's going to decide this. We, we, we cannot be powerless in this. We simply cannot let a few thousand people decide the fate of 8 billion people. It is anti-human and the deepest affront possible to every human who's come before. There have been more than 117 billion humans come before us. Think of all the sacrifice, the pain, the joy, the tears, the struggle to advance humanity. Our generation, those people here right now, we're going to be the last humans by our own choice and doing? No fucking way. So the question is, what can we do? What can we do about it? I'm sorry to say I do not have an easy solution. No one does. Um, but to me, any solution has to start with a massive increase in public awareness on these issues. Eliezer Yudkowsky, in his Time Magazine article, gave us a 1% chance of survival as a species. The article came out in May. Since then, he says he's been very surprised at how the general public has been more receptive to his messaging than the tech community. So much so, he doubled humanity's chances of surviving. Now to 2%. So please talk to people about this. Engage with others about this. This is the debate of our time. And there's no time to waste. As you engage in this debate, you're going to encounter something that I've encountered. And that is people are going to call you a doomer. A lot of people do not want to hear about this. They just want to go about their lives, pretend this doesn't exist, bury their head in the sand, la la la. When you bring it up, they may call you a doomer. Let's get something straight. The people fighting against AI doom are not the fucking doomers. The people advancing AI capabilities faster than safety, Sam Altman, Ilya, Jerome, you guys are the fucking doomers. You're the ones causing the doom. It is pure projection to take the people who care about solving this problem and paint them as the doomers. No fucking way. One of my last points, government can't save us here. It's all moving way too fast. I'm a fan of government, but government has not even been able to in any way successfully align social media with human goals and values in many, many years. Technology just moves way too fast. There's no way the government is going to meaningfully, meaningfully address this. There is, however, one thing that government could do. I don't think there's any chance that it happens. But a presidential executive order signed by the president could be tremendously impactful. Um, Connor Leahy uh, advocates for a presidential executive order that would cap training runs at what it took to make chat GPT-4. So quickly, a training run is a very expensive, very compute-heavy exercise that um, goes where the internet companies go and capture a ton of internet data, compress it, and bring that into the AI models. Uh, the training run that created chat GPT-4 cost $100 million just for the compute power alone. So 
the executive order would say. Um, we're all allowed to keep using ChatGPT4, uh, but the compute power used to create it cannot be exceeded in any future training runs. Um, people will say, oh, if the American companies do this, China will pass us. Um, we currently have more than a 12 to 18 month lead in all things AI on China. There is certainly a competitive risk there. Um, I would ask you to consider the risk of losing to China versus everyone dying. But these are complicated issues. So what is my best advice other than advocacy and talking to people about it for how to deal with this? Mo Gaudat says, enjoy life now more than ever, that tomorrow is not assured. Live today like every day is your last. It's a very different thought to think that all of the tomorrows, everyone's tomorrows, forever into the future, are at risk as well. But this approach, enjoying life, enjoying each other, being kind to each other, is aligned with a better future, whether or not we get to utopia or extinction. Mo says we are teaching these super intelligent AIs every day with every keystroke we make. And so he says we should be kind and courteous to AI systems as we interact with them. I've been doing it for a couple of months. It's kind of fun. When I use ChatGPT, I'll say, thank you so much. You've been so helpful. I really appreciate that. He says that AGI will do almost a tabulation. It'll take in every word that's ever been written on the internet and you know, this is sort of silly, but also a little bit empowering. He says that every social media post you've ever made, including the ones you're going to make into the future, will be brought into this tabulation and that it could come down to one person's one last post that is the final data point that swings the tabulation. So in his book, Scary Smart, great book. I recommend everyone who's watching this podcast, read that book. Mo puts it on each of us. I'd like to close by reading from his book. He writes, instead of using our intelligence to compete, we should use our intelligence to create abundance. Instead of selling more, we should aim to waste less. Instead of gambling, aim for prosperity for everyone. Instead of fighting, aim for resolution and trust. Instead of sex robots, aim for happy relationships. We are the parents of these artificially intelligent infants. And just as with children, it's not what we tell them, but what we do that will shape them. The way we treat each other and the planet will inform their morality. How we behave will inform how these children will be. Which brings me to one crucial question in this short book, I want to leave you with. He writes, How will you be? This is your wake up call. There is no problem more important than this one. And while I have been concerned about climate change, democracy for many years now, I believe that this problem is more urgent than either of those. This is the most dire immediate threat in human history. Humanity is capable of incredible things. Please do not feel powerless in this. You can't stop personally nuclear war, climate change, child poverty. But surely we, the 8 billion can stop a few thousand of our neighbors from causing human extinction. I don't know how, but literally everything is at stake. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'd like you to join me. Thank you so much for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe. 
In episode two of For Humanity, we're going to take a closer look at the alignment problem. In future episodes, we will profile AI safety heroes and villains. We'll look at issues and concepts, and we will be doing interviews with key people in this field. I cannot wait for that. Sam Altman, I would love for you to be the first interview on this podcast. Please come on down. Thanks again for your time. This is hard stuff, but we can do big things. For Humanity, I'm John Sherman. I'll see you back here soon.